Okay, it is time to talk Minnesota Vikings football on the R Lads Football Network and also the R Lads Football YouTube channel and the Prime Sports Network YouTube channel. Um, your host, Greg DePalma, and joining me for the very first time talking Minnesota Vikings is Matthew Collar, who uh, I actually got introduced to from uh, a, a longtime friend and a very uh, – uh, I mean, an entrepreneur is uh, an excellent word for him because uh, what New Hornsby did with Pro Football Focus is, is just to revolutionize uh, statistics in sports and especially in the NFL. But Matthew Collar wrote a book uh, and uh, detailing everything that went on uh, with Neil and Pro Football Focus, and that's how we got introduced. So, Matthew, it's good to have you on uh, on the network, and uh, I look forward to talking to you and Neil a little bit later on down the road as well. But it's also good to talk Minnesota Vikings football with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. And uh, the, the way to describe Neil, I think, is just the most interesting man in the world is the way that I would uh, describe Neil Hornsby, the founder of PFF. Uh, so it was really fun to spend a, a year and a half with Neil writing my book. And I'm looking forward to that episode we're going to do. But I also got a lot going on here covering the Minnesota Vikings. I mean, they have a lot of offseason decisions to make. Absolutely. I was going through all of the free agents. Uh, it's a long list. So we're going to have a lot of uh, a, a very interesting discussion on all of the player uh, movement for the Minnesota Vikings this offseason and what the team can do to get better because it's a very tough division now with the Packers and the Lions that they're just getting better and the Bears are controlling the draft. So a very interesting division, the NFC North this offseason and of course for 2024. I have to start off by asking you, as uh, we just finished uh, the uh, video that is going to be available, by the way, at our lads uh, YouTube channel, the our lads football YouTube channel. You can check that out. Uh, we'll have a, a link in the description of this video uh, if anybody wants uh, to find out what the top five needs are. Um, and we're going to go over that uh, on this video as well in this segment here on Prime Sports Network. But um, I have to ask you about the fans because uh, we, 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 you touched up on do they stay the course with Kirk Cousins and, and that could affect their cap and try to go for it again? Or do they try to just be patient and, and reload in 2025 is, I guess, the best way of putting it. Um, how do, how do, do the fans, I'm sure they understand this. Do, do you have a, an idea? Do you have a good gauge on, on which way you think they want to go? I would say about 90% of the fan base is ready to move on from Kirk Cousins. And that doesn't mean they don't like Kirk Cousins because over the last two years, whether it was winning 13 games or having a Netflix show or just having a head coach that bought into him and a team that bought into him, Kirk Cousins approval rating has never been higher. And uh, you even saw that with him going up and taking his shirt off on Monday night football or whatever, Sunday night, whatever it was uh, national TV and all that. And uh, that's his personality has come out a little bit more over the last couple of years. And even he said to us that he's felt more comfortable in Minnesota than ever. And we even gave him the media good guy award this year because uh, it was evident that he was just feeling very good about his position and so forth. And yet, you're talking about someone who's 36 years old who is coming off a major injury. Aaron Rodgers could say whatever he wants. I've seen guys come back from Achilles injuries. You don't just pop right back up from that one. Uh, it's not the ACL and it can have long-term effect, especially on someone of his age who is already not mobile, but has to really use his lower half to drive the football. So if there's not the same strength there, or there's a recovery process, is he going to be able to drive the football into tight windows from someone who already didn't have the strongest arm. And I think the Vikings fans, to bring it back to that, they really get this. They really understand this, that where the team's roster is at and the risk that goes along with bringing back an older quarterback who is coming off a significant injury, plus there will be competition for him. There will be other teams that are interested in Cousins. That means competition. You are not getting him for $10 million that it's just time to move on. And I think that they've been stuck in this second gear for quite some time, really since they signed Cousins, of, hey, you're in the hunt. Every year you're sort of in the hunt. And you have one pop-up year that you win 13 games, but you have a negative point differential and you lose immediately in the playoffs. It's never been great. So they've gone through this for a long time and they've never seen greatness from this team with this quarterback 
why would you bring him back and do this again with yeah. all the needs we talked about? Yep. And you need every defensive line position. You need, I didn't even mention linebacker. Uh, Jordan Hicks is a free agent. The, that didn't even mention depth receiver. They're mm-hmm. losing their number three receiver, KJ Osborne. I mean, there's so much to do on this roster. I, fans are bright enough to understand. How do you do all that with Kirk Cousins as your quarterback? Because if you have a 36-year-old quarterback, what's your winning window? It's today. Sure. Yeah. It's right now. You it's don't even year. know if he's yeah. playing two years. Right. So yeah. I, I think that most fans have gotten around to just want something fresh, want something new. And one last point to mention is they also took notice of Jordan Love, the Detroit Lions. <laughs> yeah. They're very aware that the Chicago Bears are drafting twice in the top 10, where the Vikings are drafting only twice in the top 50. And how are you going to compete with that? By running the same thing back over and over again? Probably not. And that's uh, that's actually a good thing for management because, you know, feeling the pressure from the fans to win now, that's the hard part. But when you actually have a fan base that you can judge that, hey, you know what, we're okay with it. We don't, you don't need to do this. You don't have to rush things in 2020. We're willing to take one step back to try to get three steps forward. That's a good situation to have. And I, I would I would have to guess that why would they not be going that direction? when the fan base would be behind them. So uh, it sounds like that's uh, that's uh, exactly what we're going to see this offseason for the Vikings. And um, does that start with more than likely? Do you see them? Again, we were talking about it before, but we can kind of start with uh, what they're going to do with quarterback. So first of all, uh, Jaron Hall, when they picked him in the fifth round last year, was that just best player available, long-term backup? Is that all they saw in Jaron Hall? Yeah, I think they liked a lot of things about Jaron Hall. Uh, he was a very accurate quarterback at BYU, really mature guy. He had been there for a while, as most BYU players are. And I think he's got a really good disposition as a quarterback where you could see him being somebody who is a long-term backup in the NFL just by the way he carries himself on a day-to-day basis. And I don't know if they were hoping this would be the next Brock Purdy or Dak Prescott or something like that when they drafted him. I think that that's what every coach is hoping for, though. You take a swing at somebody you like and then see what happens. And if he turns out to be Dak Prescott, you look like a genius. And if he doesn't, then, well, you know, it was a quarterback. It was worth a swing. In the first year, we didn't see many signs of anything more than somebody who's going to be a long-term backup. And it's hard to be convinced that there's upside there when he is, I think he's 25 years old now. Um, So how much is he going to jump forward? They can't really factor him him into any future discussions about the quarterback position. Okay. Uh, What is your guess? Because we know the Vikings are not in a position to trade up. Uh, with all of the needs that they have, even though we'll find out in free agency exactly what they're going to be able to, what spots are going to be able to fill. But you would think if they haven't filled the majority of their spots and they still have to make sure that they have uh, as much draft capital as possible, the, the, the chances are they're going to trade down before they trade up. Um, and you would also think in the position they are in the draft that that makes a lot of sense because there seems to be so far, and it's early still, we haven't even hit the combine yet, but the, the 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 consensus is you got the three guys that could go one two three, but then you got the next group, you know the 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 Penix juniors, the Knicks, and so forth, where you don't know where they're going to go. Some people believe, well, maybe they go in the ten to twenty. It's possible they can go fifteen to thirty. So that seems like a pretty good spot where the Vikings can either decide, you know what, we like this guy too much, we're going to get the, the the best second tier quarterback, or why don't we recoup some more draft capital, slide down a little bit and still get a quarterback that we think will be on the board late first round, early second. Yeah. I think everything is on the table here because there were reports last year that the Vikings did try to make some phone calls about potentially moving up for Anthony Richardson, but those three quarterbacks were really locked in. I am not as convinced that the teams at the top are totally fully a thousand percent locked into these quarterbacks. Uh, as going one, two, three. And if that's the case, say for New England, for example, they just watched a first round quarterback crumble because he had nothing around him. Do they really want to do that again? Or do they want to build up their roster before they draft a quarterback and go all in on somebody? If that's the case and that pick is for sale, then the Vikings are making the call. I think there's a lot of other 
teams that are making the call too, which is what makes that so difficult. And if that doesn't work out, then they have to be sold on someone else. Is that JJ McCarthy, Bo Nix, Michael Penix? I spend every day on my podcast sorting through all that, trying to figure out who would be the best fit, what are the potential options, and it's just hard to say. Like, yeah. which one of those quarterbacks are they yeah. going to like? Because they're going to go to the combine, they're going to go to these pro days, and if they get sold on somebody along the way, and look, I mean, Penix and. Uh, you know, Bo Nix didn't sell the world on themselves at the senior bowl. So that's kind of our first step. But if they sit in a meeting room with Bo Nix and are wowed and think like, this is our guy who can handle our offense and so forth, then you can put one of those guys in one of the best positions offensively in the entire NFL. How many teams could offer you two first round receivers? One of them widely considered the best in the game. If he's not first, he's second or third. And also a guy who emerged as a quality first rounder in Jordan Addison, a pro bowl tight end and two of the best tackles in the league <laughs> yeah. and your quarter and, and your coach is a former quarterback yeah. uh, whose offense has really shown to work in terms of the passing game. Th there's a lot to, to work with there. I think that they're one of the best positions you will ever see to drop a quarterback into kind of reminds me maybe of Philly after they acquired AJ Brown. Like we, we know this that, or, you know, Brock Purdy, of course, if you want somebody to succeed, there are guys who are transcendent. They're so good. It doesn't matter. Josh Allen's probably like this, that no matter where he showed up or what situation it was, he was going to succeed because he's just that great. But 95% of quarterbacks are greatly influenced by where they land. That's and it. so I think if you're the Vikings, you have to consider that element of it. Um, but I also wouldn't be surprised if Kevin O'Connell would only draft a quarterback, if he was totally fully sold that that guy could be his 10 year quarterback. So are any of these guys in that second tier, somebody who can be your 10 year quarterback? Uh, I guess we might find out. We might not. They may get cold feet and bring back Kirk. I don't know. Uh, is there any discussion rumors or anything like that regarding, uh, any quarterbacks outside the organization right now in free agency or via trade? The one name that has come up and they have been connected to potential trade up options, by the way, Dan Graziano of ESPN reported that during the Super Bowl. So I, again, would not be super shocked if they were trying to do that. But Sam Darnold is the name that came up from Tom Pelissero of NFL Network. And I was not shocked by that because it's the same sort of general offensive tree of Kyle Shanahan, McVay, Kevin O'Connell worked with McVay. So similar ideals to their offenses. And they would also have a connection there to have some intel on Sam Darnold. And when you think about it, you go back to the situation he landed into in New York terrible then yep. look at what he dealt with in carolina extra super duper terrible with <laughs> yeah. matt rule there and the, the players around him not very good and so he goes out and he takes a backup quarterback job and sometimes that's what somebody needs i mean we have seen this with ryan Tannehill, we've seen it with geno smith and historically many quarterbacks have not worked out at first and then gotten the right opportunity so if you were to pair say sam darnold with michael Penix or something and you're just hoping one of them is good enough to be your guy you give them great receivers a great scheme you improve the run game a bit you might have something there and that's why even the suggestion of cousins coming back to me is just, it's hard to figure out like, yeah. why would this work when you have a situation that could potentially pump up a different quarterback who is younger and not coming off severe injuries. So the Sam Darnold idea is pretty interesting to me, honestly. And you're not going to have to give up a whole lot either. So right. yeah, yep. that's important. Okay. Uh, let's take a look now at the skill position. Uh, by the way, I have the uh, Minnesota Vikings depth chart page uh, from uh, rlads.com up. Uh, let's go over uh, starting uh, with the uh, running backs. Um, and it looked, I, and look, I, I am not surprised that, that Madison struggled a little bit because uh, first of all, he comes out of college, good player, nice player. But nobody ever thought he was going to be some superstar that he was going to just, Oh, you know, Dalvin cook's going to leave and Madison's going to come in and look like Dalvin cook. Um I, I, cause I've, I've seen this uh, many times before uh, and many other positions in the, in the league. And it kind of happened that way. He, he just did not, you know, certain players just look better when they don't have their snap count added 
to from 500 to a thousand or whatever the case may be. And that's, I think what might've happened to Madison uh, is he looks like he's a much better fit as a backup, as a partner, as opposed to a number one uh, bell cow or whatever you want to call it, because it's 3.9 average. Just ain't going to cut it. Ch Chandler comes in and he surprises uh, only because he didn't look good the year before, but he surprises has a really solid uh, season overall 4.5 average. Uh, so that is pretty good, but still do the Vikings feel that, yeah, we can go another year. Maybe we'll uh, sign a, a, you know, a, a a mid-level running back in free agency to, to, to battle with the other two, or we'll use one of our, you know, fourth, fifth round draft picks on a running back. You never know. We did it with Chandler. Or do you think that they're serious, uh, seriously looking at trying to find maybe their number one running back? I think it would be pretty fun if they brought in Saquon Barkley, uh, but <laughs> I don't know if he's going to, he's going to sign here. Yeah. So this is a, an interesting situation because you're right that pushing a player from being uh, a role guy who starts a couple games a year due to injury to 17 games of RB one is a totally different level. And maybe it was a lot to ask with Madison. There's other moving parts to this as well, which is they didn't run block particularly well. In, in my opinion, I think they had decent PFF run blocking grades, but I also think there were a lot of negative things that happened. And if one person makes a mistake in a run blocking that can blow up a play there were a lot of plays that were instantly blown up in the backfield that had nothing to do with Alexander Madison. Marshall Falk would have gotten taken down on the same handoffs. They never seemed to really develop an identity around him. And when he was at his best, he was in Gary Kubiak's outside zone, the Rick Dennison Kubiak, the staple system that they had taught 50 million times through the years with Gary Kubiak. And he had come out of college in an outside zone system in, in Boise state. I think it really worked for him I, uh, to be able to kind of have like simple options. You know, that system, it's either kind of hit the edge or cut and that's it. And the, yeah. Those are your options. And when he was asked to follow double teams and when is my you know left guard going to work up to the linebacker and when do I need to make a cut? When do I need to slow down? When do I need to speed up? I don't think that fit well. If he's in the right system with a better offensive line, maybe it's four and a half yards of carry for him like it was uh, early in his career. But the difference with Ty Chandler is Ty Chandler is special with the football in his hands. He ran a 4.38 at like 210 pounds, and he's got twitchiness. He's got toughness. The issue was getting Ty Chandler to know where to run and when and how there were many times when he got more opportunities where Nick Mullins or whoever took the ball and went back to hand it off to him. And he was on the other side from where he was <laughs> supposed to be. And it was like, Oh, now what are we going to have to do here? There were major disasters in pass blocking, which is a huge deal for a pass first offense. So I don't think you can ask Ty Chandler to be the guy and understand all those things. Cause he might not ever get it which in my mind, you got to go find somebody else with the money situation they're in with the quarterback and potentially even dead money. If Kirk cousins leaves all the other things they have as top priorities, it's really hard for me to see Tony Pollard or some of, you know, Josh Jacobs being the guy that they look for. I think it's much more likely to be a Latavius Murray type that okay. they could use another veteran. And then you draft one just to draft one. Um, Ken A. Wong was not in this conversation. Dwayne McBride's not in this conversation. So you probably need a veteran who is proven as a quality player, especially in the pass blocking area that uh, you can trust to kind of combine with Chandler and Madison. All right. Uh, next up, let's talk about, uh, well, first of all, you've already mentioned, of course, Hawkinson. We all know uh, how that uh, worked out for the Vikings last season because um, Hawkinson, it was interesting. Hawkinson, you you wondered, and, and this is why I was, this is his perfect example of, of, uh, of, of why some players just don't fit in some schemes or some roles that they're uh, supposed to play. And, and in Detroit, he was just asked to block too much. And, and, and that's just, you didn't draft me in the top 10 to be a, a blocker. So he goes to Minnesota. They're like, Hey man, you're a receiver. Just go at it. And then Josh Oliver comes over and seems to do a pretty decent job as a number two. So they're pretty set there. Right. I mean, what do you think they, I know their other two guys are free agents, but it's possible that they all come back. 
Yeah, I would say so. Uh, Nick Muse, they really like. And, um, you know, Johnny Munt is a guy who filled in with Hawkinson's injury. The one consideration that they have to have is that when TJ Hawkinson had surgery, which was just recently, it would be a lot to expect him to be ready to go week one. So this might be a he's out for the first four weeks of the season type of situation. And you need to figure out who's going to be tight end one. And as much as Josh Oliver is a great tight end two, he's not a guy you can just flex into that position and take on all the route running, getting on the same page as the quarterback. You really need more of a receiving tight end. So we could I think that bringing back Munt because he knows the system probably makes sense. And the fact that they already like Nick Muse and have developed him over a couple of years that that room is is one of the strongest parts of the roster. So I would guess that that's how that ends up playing out. Unless some other team really wants to pay Johnny Munt a lot of money. <laughs> I guess that's possible. <laughs> but it feels much more like it'd be at home coming back to this system with Minnesota. Uh, do you think they would trust Muse as, uh, to fill in for a month? I don't know if they're there yet with him. Okay. Yeah, he's been a practice squad guy who's developed for a couple years. Maybe we're talking one year away from that. The tight okay. end's a hard position. It's yes. a hard position if you're TJ Hawkinson and you're a first-round draft pick. If you're a seventh-rounder developing, I'm not sure they're there. But they like him. I mean, so he took big steps. He made the team out of training camp, which none of us expected them to keep four tight ends. So he's he's a good player. I, I wouldn't be shocked if Munt got a good offer somewhere else and left, and they stuck with Nick Muse. Okay, let's go to wide receiver. And yeah, I mean, not many teams have Jefferson and Addison. That's that's for sure. Uh, not surprising either that Addison had the rookie uh, season that he had. A uh, terrific player. And Jefferson just needs to stay healthy now. And that's going to be a heck of a duo moving forward. But the number three and number four receivers, those two guys are free agents. What do you expect to see happening with those two? I would expect uh, at least KJ Osborne to leave in free agency. Um, he had big expectations coming into this year, just did not live up to those. I don't think he's a good fit for this. If there's a team like San Francisco is a fit for basically everyone, but <laughs> you know how San Francisco gets the ball into the playmakers hands Yeah. when KJ Osborne has got the ball in his hands, running slants screens ends around. He's pretty good. He's kind of like a halfback with how tough he is and, and he's quick and he's, he's shifty. He was a great punt returner in college. He is not a double move type of wide receiver deep down the field. And I think that they wanted him to have a complete route tree. And that's just a lot to ask for him. So they need somebody who's going to do that at their number three position. And Brandon Powell was great for them. I mean, for somebody who's been a career punt returner, he came in and had to fill in when Jefferson was out for a while and really mastered a lot of those things with the route running. I think it was a big surprise to everybody uh, that he was able to handle that role so well. So I think he will be somebody who comes back to this team. They really, really like Brandon Powell, but they need a number three. Uh, as much as those one and two are going to dominate and you have you know TJ Hawkinson, we see this all the time. You get to the playoffs and that number three, that Jawan Jennings shows up and catches a touchdown or Nicole Hardman. And like you can't just have one or two and hope it's going to work out. And as far as their other receivers go, they don't really have anybody on the cusp. Uh, okay. They wanted, they wanted Jalen Naylor to work out a couple of serious injuries, kept him out for most of the season. Can't really rely on him going forward. So they need to dip into free agency or the draft uh, to fill out the rest of this. Okay, so number three wide receiver. And would that receiver, uh, would that be more than likely somebody that has to have slot experience? Yeah, maybe. I, okay. I don't think so. I mean, Not I kind of think that. Okay. Yeah, I kind of think that everybody does, though, these days. Like, everybody has to play everywhere. You know, right? I mean, nobody's just lining up like <laughs> Terrell Owens on the outside every play or yeah. Randy Moss. But, you know, the guys are moving around a lot. But they like to put Addison and Jefferson into the slot and even TJ Hawkinson in two tight end sets. So it could be a pure outside wide receiver. But more likely than not, anybody you sign is going to have to be versatile. Do, okay. Uh, do do you, would you if you had a guess more possession or more speed? Yeah, I think route running is really key in this uh, and intelligence because they ask a ton of these wide receivers. It was really impressive how Jordan Addison mastered so much of it because they ask them to read and react 
a lot to really understand how defenses are covering them uh, to be on the same page as the quarterback to handle a lot of different types of routes and things like that. Even Justin Jefferson, when they first put in the offense was like, I think I've got it, but there's still a lot to handle. So they need somebody. I think that a veteran wide receiver who's been around and has been, you know, 30, 40 catch guy is probably the best option here rather okay. than hoping that a rookie could pick it up quickly. All right. That makes sense. Offensive line. So, uh, wow. Uh, we talked about this before, but six, all six depth offensive linemen are free agents. That is, that's a lot of work. Of course, uh, uh, Reisner is also a free agent and he's the starting guard. So there's a lot of work to be done there, but at least they have very good bookends. So that's not, that's not anything you have to worry about. Are they satisfied also with Bradbury moving forward? Because he's never lived up to that first round billing, but are they just, okay, you know, he's okay. We're just going to, he's, we're just going to go with Bradbury or do they also feel, I mean, that with Reisner is a free agent. Ingram's still young. So you would hope that he would uh, pick up his game as a second round draft pick in 2022, that that interior you're going to have to be looking at what, maybe two to three new players. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with uh, Garrett Bradbury, I don't think with all the other needs they could afford to replace him. And as far as his performance, it's true that he's been, uh, in the last couple of years, more of a middling center in the first few seasons of his career, he struggled and even got benched at one point. We saw him take a step forward with Kevin O'Connell, definitely not under the elite category, but I think that he's got a lot of the intangible things that people love about centers. Uh, one that I maybe took for granted is the snaps, the ball. Well, um, I was watching Patrick Mahomes lean over and have to catch every snap. And I thought, you know what? We don't see that a lot for Bradbury. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he is a leader of that group. I mean, he is, uh, the guy who's operating the entire thing and knows the offense really well, I think gets along with their offensive line coach, Chris Cooper, extremely well. So he's not going anywhere. Uh, a right guard, though, I mean, there's a great argument to replace Ed Ingram. After two seasons, he's been in the top five in pressures allowed in both of those seasons, which is not acceptable. Uh, he did not, in my opinion, show a ton of progress from year one to year two. Okay. And maybe you think in year three that he can, but that's not something you can really bet on. At the same time, it's all about resources. Who can you replace and, and so forth? But I think they need competition for him. So if it's bringing in a veteran who's been a backup and saying, all right, this battle is going to go on every day. Even when they brought in Dalton Reisner, we weren't sure if he was going to play left or right guard because Ingram had been playing so poorly. And then at left guard, Reisner is a, a good pick to come back, but I think they really want somebody who can run block better. Reisner is a very good pass blocker. He does not get beat very often quickly in pass blocking, but it's just not a difference maker in the run game. It's probably being polite. It, it's, it's a struggle. And I think that's why teams did not sign him and why he was available into the regular season when the Vikings signed him is that he's just not an impact player at all and is somewhat of a liability in the run blocking game. And uh, they need to improve there quite a bit because the last two years under Kevin O'Connell, the run game has been a total non-factor. Okay, so even though um, you mentioned in our uh, other video, the Arleds video, that left guard is need number four, um, guard in general is definitely up there. It, you, you can say, yeah, we have to replace uh, uh, Reisner at left guard, but Ingram cannot go into camp without some competition. Totally. Yeah. And in comparison to their other needs on the defensive line, uh, this one is nothing compared to that, but yeah, they, I mean, they need someone, they need someone to just start. And as you mentioned, they have no backups. They have no development path for anybody that you could say, Oh, well, this guy's going to be the next man up. There's just not that. I mean, Blake Brandle is on the team still. He's much more of a backup. He was forced into duty at guard a little bit at the end of the year, and it didn't go particularly well. I think he's like an in case of emergency guy. So there's work to be done. They're still on the offensive line. It's pretty much those two positions. I would say uh, maybe a veteran backup trying to win a spot at right guard and then a legitimate starter at left guard. All right, let's uh, scroll on down and take a look at the defensive side. And we'll start at edge rush 
which is your second need for the offseason. And it's not because of what was on the field necessarily last year, but it's about free agents and what may not be there if they can't bring back these uh, could be expensive players. Now, Hunter, 16 and a half sacks, premier edge rusher. And then one of them uh, had his second eight sack season. So he's got what, 23 and four years. Davenport hardly played in his one year. So what, what do you think is going to go to, what, what do you think? How do you think they're going to approach these three? Yeah, I think that really everything ties into the quarterback because if they don't draft a quarterback at number 11, then defensive end becomes the huge favorite for them to take a player there. And as far as the other side goes, I could see them making a pretty significant offer to Daniil Hunter. But if I'm Daniil Hunter, I'm probably looking at this market going, all right, the top couple of guys might get franchise tagged. And then everybody's looking at me, uh, looking for that difference maker. And, you know, look how much money Chicago has to throw around somebody like that. Are the Vikings really willing to go? Somebody who's 30 years old at the peak of their market, 16 and a half sacks. You come off of that. You're not getting a deal from that a player in that, uh, you know, in that contract. So that one is tough. And then you have to go into free agency and start looking, going, all right, who else do yeah. you bring in? Do you bring back DJ Wanham? I thought that he did a good job handling a tough situation after Marcus Davenport went down, but he's not an impact player. It's eight sacks is not always eight sacks. If it, it makes sense, like he's not consistently creating pressure. He's not a difference maker. He's somebody that you'd love to have on your team as a secondary player to come in in certain situations. He's good against the run, but he's not somebody that you're saying, oh yeah, play him a thousand snaps over there. Impact player. That's just not who he's ever going to be. Okay. So they need, they need to find that. I mean, and is that trying to spend big on one of the guys or what Brian Flores did when he first got to Miami was they kind of threw numbers at it. They brought in somebody like Shaq Lawson. They, they looked to the outside of, Hey, where can we get some deals? They tried to do that with Marcus Davenport. That didn't work out. Maybe they take another swing at him on an extremely cheap deal to return I have a tough time seeing that considered how banged up he was last year and barely played. This is a tough spot. I mean, this needs a complete construction. Like when you, if anybody ever watches house hunters or something and they're talking about, well, you know, I, I want something to uh, be a project. Oh, this is, this is not just a project. This is a gut job. This needs all sort of, sort of investment and time into it and draft capital. I mean, they need to probably spend some fourth and fifth round draft picks into this defensive line, because in my opinion, you don't need two edge rushers and two defensive tackles. You need like four edge rushers and four defensive tackles to be considered really, really good at the defensive line position because they have to rotate so much. Yep. So th this is one where they got to really point a lot of their um, off season capital at in order to fix. And of course uh, we'll, we'll be able to know what they have left after free agency heading into the draft. Um, are, are they going to, by the way, are they going to tag anyone? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. They can't. I saw Adam Schefter tweet that Daniil Hunter was a player that could be tagged, but they can't. It's in his uh, extension that they worked out that okay. they would not be able to franchise tag him. They can't tag Cousins uh, because of his contract either. And other than that, I mean, I there's nobody that I could look at on the free agent list and say, I don't think you're tagging uh, David Questenberry or something. So sure. okay. you know, there's nobody else that I see as like a, a clear candidate for that. Okay. Fair enough. And, and, and could you see the Vikings, if there is one player that they're going to spend money on that you would, you, you would think it's going to be Hunter. Yeah, I, I think so. It really comes down to the price tag for him. Because if you're on Daniil Hunter's side, they've reworked your contract three years in a row. And that's got to be pretty frustrating that they have not ever gone all in with the huge yeah. contract for him. So if Hunter's representation goes to the combine and has some conversations at, uh, you know, prime 47 or whatever there in Indianapolis, and there's a lot of teams interested that are willing to really go all in on him and give him the 25, 27 million dollars a year that elite edge rushers give then you just can't match that as the Vikings. You have so many needs that you just can't pour all of your resources into one guy. Sure. If we're talking more around the 20 mil, 
Well, I think that they would be able to do that. But the, the problem is sometimes when you get into guys who are on their third contract or second contract, there's only so much messing around with the cap you can do with those guys unless you sign them to five-year deals. But if you sign a 30-year-old to a five-year deal, oh, yeah. is that really, you know what I mean? Especially yeah. he missed you know two seasons fairly recently with injury. I haven't been able to make this one work in my mind, but you know, maybe the hometown discount is a thing. I, I just, I tend to think that Daniil Hunter's going elsewhere. Okay. Uh, and let's uh, keep along the defensive line because uh, there's, matter of fact, five free agents on the defensive line, including Bullard. Um, uh, Phillips is coming back and he had a career high 92 tackles in his second season with the Vikings, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so not just the edge, but also overall the defensive line, which is why you kind of combined those two just a, a, a couple of minutes ago. So uh, what do you think is as far as, because taking a look here at the top need list, um, number three is defensive tackle. So um, what do you, th and, and defensive tackles, nose tackles, defensive tackles, you can get those guys fairly cheaply. And free agency, if you get the right guy, and you don't have to spend too high in the draft as well. Now, of course, you get some dominant player, you can draft them high. I get that, but for the most part, you can get those guys a little bit later in the draft when you're rebuilding, like it looks like the Vikings are at least for a year or two. Right. That's kind of the question: is could you spend a lot of money and try to get an impact player there, possibly? But how much do you want to spend? And when you look at the free agent list, there might be two, three guys who could be an impact player, defensive tackle. I, when teams get these guys, they do not give them away. If you have a great defensive tackle, you hold on to that man for a very long time. Yeah. yeah and uh, you pay him all the money he needs. I mean, Chris Jones is the ultimate example of look how much a pass rushing defensive tackle can impact uh, the way that a defense plays. The Vikings have not had that in a long time. They had Sheldon Richardson in 2018 and pretty much not since. Uh, Richardson came back a few years later, was not the same guy. So do they go into free agency looking for maybe some rotational players and hoping they can throw some numbers at it? Do they try to look at a Javon Kinlaw and say, hey, maybe he's got upside and we could take a swing and hope that he finds it, whatever you know it is that's missing in San Francisco. I tend to think if you can't find it in San Francisco, <laughs> you're not going to find it elsewhere. But you Never know, you know. could take that approach, that longer term yeah. approach. And then similarly with numbers wise, spend two draft picks on it. Just hope to find the next Grady Jarrett or something. It's a really hard position when you don't have it you just feel like there's no hope in there. I mean, it's it's hard to watch when you don't have it. Yeah. And uh, it, it has been for the last couple of years since Linval Joseph left. They've been kind of flailing at that spot. Uh, that's with respect to Harrison Phillips, but he's more of a 500 snap type of player if he's going to make an impact. So I don't have a, a clear answer for this other than to just try to use use the, the multiple approach. Couple of free agents, couple of draft picks, Kind of see how it ends up playing out. Yeah, I think we have to go back to uh, let's see, John Randall. Can we go back to John? <laughs> Not Randall? quite. Not quite that far. <laughs> there was uh, there was there was a year where Linval Joseph was legitimately yeah, that, dominant. Yes, in absolutely. Yes. Twenty seventeen, and uh, before that, Sharif Floyd uh, in two thousand fifteen, oh, right. but uh, he got hurt and ended his career early because of a knee injury. Yeah. And Tom Johnson was a good rotational rusher, but that's it. Yeah. They have not had too many. Yeah, going, like said, going it, back to John Randall. Yeah, well, Kevin yeah. Williams also. It, it, yeah, because the game has changed now to that point. It used to be that, yeah, defensive tackles were just kind of run stuffers, hold up the line, because most teams did play 4-3 back, back in the day. That's just not the case anymore. Now you want that pressure in the middle, and everybody understands that if you can't get it on the outside, you better get it on the inside. All right, uh, linebacker. So four free agents there, including Hicks, who had 107 tackles pace. I mean, this is the one player that really is the big scratch of the head last year in the draft. I don't, none of us could understand how he wasn't drafted. And then he has a really good year. It's like, what the heck? Why was this guy drafted? It's like some of these, so one or two of those guys always seem to slip through somehow. And then you look and you go, wow. I mean, I know the chiefs uh, had that with uh, the Tennessee lineman a few years back. And uh, yeah, not as, not as much as a free agent, of course, but 
I mean, that, that was a really good, uh, uh, let's see, lucky, whatever the case may be, but that, that was very, uh, very, uh, cool for the Vikings to, to, to know that they've got uh, a good future uh, player in the middle of that defense, because um, uh, right now it's, it's pretty bare depending on whether or not these older free agents come back. A mystery to me, man, because you're talking about kickers being taken punters, long snappers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, you could say the Vikings are brilliant, but they drafted a running back in the seventh round who didn't make the team. And probably won't ever touch an NFL field. And then they get, I don't want to quite call him a star yet, but he was a, a star of this year's defense for sure. Uh, just really, really terrific player. And I think what the NFL probably got a little over obsessed with is the height that everyone's looking for Fred Warner. They're looking for this big, long, tall guy who gets in passing lanes and what they maybe missed is that he actually weighs a lot for somebody that height. This guy, it's like a fire hydrant to run into. He is very, very strong and also super instinctual, very, very clever. Um, I wonder, too, he's a really quiet kid. If in interviews they thought, like, I, I don't know if he's going to be able to communicate as a linebacker. And it was a little bit of a problem when he had to take on the green dot duties that he is so quiet uh, that I think it was hard for him. But. I mean, is, yeah, you look at his PFF grades from Cincinnati, you look at his awards, you look at his box score stats, checks every single box. It's really just the height and kind of reminds me of like a London Fletcher or a Sam Mills, like just a guy with a huge heart, plays super hard, and uh, he's a foundational piece for them going forward. But the rest is a problem because they got nobody. And with Jordan Hicks, he had a major leg injury last year. And I mean in an ambulance major leg injury last year. That's got to be a concern with his age. Super high class player, high intelligence, great leader, all the things you want from a linebacker. But an injury and age, is that the guy you want to bring back? But once again, the theme of all these positions is they didn't develop the next man up. And, you know, Troy Dye, uh, a couple of the guys along the way kind of came in and out, but they never had the next player who was going to step into that position. So you're once again talking about potentially going into free agency and having to get multiple linebackers in free agency. So now we're up to six defensive linemen. They got to sign <laughs> three, four linebackers, uh, f five offensive linemen. Where's this money coming from? Do you have it? Cause I, I don't think they, uh, it's, they are, they are in tough in this position. Maybe Hicks will come back. I think he really likes it in Minnesota and really got along great with Brian Flores. That's probably the best option for them to keep that leadership in the locker room. But if he doesn't want to come back, I I don't know. You got to be uh, bargain hunting at that position. Uh, so Asamoa, uh, he hasn't developed, right? No, unfortunately. Yeah, that's another guy. Uh, so out of sight, out of mind last year that I thought of tried Troy Die first because Die was ahead of him on the depth chart. That when uh, Jordan Hicks got hurt, it was Troy Die who was stepping up into that position more. Uh, with Asamoa, one of the issues with their 2022 draft class is that all the defensive players so far have busted. And the reason in part, I think is, and this is not to excuse that happening because if they're good players, they'll play, but they change defensive coordinators. And I think that Ed Donatell had a certain vision of the type of players he wanted. And then Brian Flores came in and had a totally different vision. Yeah. And so we saw the guys that they drafted in 2023, like Makai Blackman or undrafted, but signed, you know, Ivan Pace guys that were handpicked by Flores. They got a lot of playing time and they worked really well in his system. Whereas Lewis seen Andrew Booth, Jr. Brian Osamoa, None of those guys saw the field basically at all. And I think the big issue with Osamo is I mentioned Ivan Pace and how he's thick and he's strong. And when some when a guard tries to run into him, he can slam into him and stop him in, in their tracks, which is something I wouldn't have expected from that size. Brian Osamo just gets run out of the building. He just gets, as one of my offensive line friends says, thrown out of the club. That's what happens. If a guard gets his hands on him, he just gets thrown out of the club. And it's that's hard to live at that position and just not be able to, uh, you know, take on those blocks yeah. with, without just getting pushed out of the way. I think he's legitimately just too small. And the first time that I saw him, 
I thought he was a running back. Like when we walked out there for wow. rookie mini camp, I was like, who, and he was wearing a 30 number, but I was like, Oh, there's, who is this running back that they must have just picked up? <laughs> nope, that's their starting linebacker. And I, I just, I think that that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, one of those players that definitely you would think needs a scheme switch, uh, yeah. another place uh, that might fit uh, his abilities if he has them. All right. Uh, we'll wrap up with the secondary and uh, th- look, the safeties. I mean, Metellus and Bynum. Now, Metellus, is he, does he also play a little bit of nickel? Oh, Metellus plays everything. Yeah. What a fascinating player. What a fat. I mean, one of my favorite stories since I've covered the team, Josh Metellus, because he was a guy who was cut out of his first training camp as a fifth, maybe sixth round draft pick out of Michigan and came back on the practice squad and played special teams, special teams, special teams, finally got a little bit of opportunity in 2022, put enough on tape for Brian Flores to get here in 2023 and say, you know what? I'm intrigued by this player. And they started putting him in at nickel. They started then moving him over to linebacker. And then they started blitzing with him off the edge. And they were like, this guy does everything. He is one of the most pure intelligence players I've ever run across. Uh, I think that he was on track at Michigan to go be a lawyer or something. He was on NFL network the other day, breaking down film. He is extremely high intelligence, but also a playmaker. He caused fumbles. He got interceptions. I mean, he's, he's gone from somebody who we didn't, we were, you know, if you're talking about like a depth chart like this, you wouldn't have even been considering him to someone that I consider now a star of this defense because of his versatility. And sometimes that means just landing with the right guy. Brian Flores saw the talent and said, there we're going to find a way. And they played him like crazy. He played like 90% of the snaps. So he, he was great. And then Bynum had a, a breakout with 137 yep. tackles. So, and then Smith is still hanging on at 35. It looks like safety, or at least those three guys. I mean, Smith, how many years is, is he going to play? It might be zero. Uh, We don't know. He was in pretty tough at the end of last year. He's a guy who will play through any injury at any time, but we could tell that he was really banged up at the end of last season. And he's had a borderline hall of fame career. I wrote an article about his hall of fame case earlier this year. And it's it's a strong one. Um, You not too many guys have six pro bowls like him. He was an all pro uh, one of the finals for defensive MVP in 2017, all time. Great Viking for sure. But you've reached a point where every year could be the last year. And he he told us that even last year at a press conference. So it might be a situation where Harrison Smith retires and then Metellus moves into that spot. Uh, That wouldn't surprise me at all. Or, you know, he could give it one more year or he could ask the team, trade me to Kansas City or something. They trade me to San Francisco, you know, somewhere where he might have a chance to win a Super Bowl with the place that this team is in now. I don't know why you'd come back unless you just, you know, love Minnesota and want to stay here. It's not a team that's in a position to compete for a Super Bowl, as I think we've really covered of looking at all these positions. So, <laughs> I, yeah, his his status, though, very much up in the air and um, very impressive year for Cam Bynum, as you mentioned, somebody fourth round pick who came out as a corner and another super high intelligence player who was great for them last year. Now, can uh, Jay Ward, he was a fourth round pick. Can Jay Ward fill Smith's snaps if Smith retires? No. Uh, Metellus could, but not Ward. But Ward might be a guy who could be intriguing to handle some of the Metellus role because he played everything in college. He played corner, linebacker, safety. He did a little bit of everything. I think he needs maybe another full year of development, though, before we're ready to have that conversation. All right, because that also, I mean, we could talk about some of the other players because, again, there's, there's, besides Murphy, um, th- there's some guys who are not household names. So um, you look at corner, you've got Evans. Uh, we've already mentioned Ward. You got Blackman. Uh, so those are two third and fourth round draft picks the last couple of years. What, what's, what's, let's go with those two because those are the important ones right now w- w- in that spot. So, um, is that like the normal three, like for 2024, do you see it being Murphy Blackman and Evans? I think they need one more. Okay. Um, Caleb Evans was an interesting story because he started out the year pretty rough. And then in the middle 10 weeks played really well. And then at the end of the season got benched multiple times oh, because okay. he was really struggling. 
Yeah. And it's, it's just, it was just a roller coaster. He is a very athletic player who doesn't play the ball very well. I think he had zero interceptions in college and his sort of claim to fame moment was getting hit in the face with the ball. He, he did the thing that happened to the lions guy before the lions guy against um, the chargers got hit in the face with the ball. Couldn't bring an interception, turned into a key touchdown. He's just not good at playing football. And that is to me, that means you're a backup. If you can handle the role, give them eight to 10 weeks, but you can't really get game changing interceptions or pass deflections or anything like that. You're probably a backup. Okay. Uh, Murphy is a good player. I think that he was put in a different role than really works best for him. Uh, if in fact, if, if Harrison Smith retires, then I think we'll see Byron Murphy as a slot corner. I think he's better there than he is as a pure outside corner. It was more, Hey, Metellus is working as the slot. So you got to go play outside. And uh, I was just straight up impressed with Makai Blackman. His upside is limited. Okay. He came into the league at 24. He's not the biggest guy, but he plays the football really well. I think he's got really great instincts. He's going to work well with Brian Flores. But as I go through this, do you hear Deion Sanders or no. Rod Woodson? Like that's no. the thing is that they need, hey, they need an impact player here at this position, or you're just going to be a week to week defense if you don't have that guy. That's how I look at it. Yeah, and yeah, this is the fifth need. Uh, and on some teams, yes. some situations, this could be the number yep. one need that, like yep. you said, th th it looks like there's bodies in the room, but not that number one guy. And until you get that number one guy, you know, I mean, Metellus and Bynum sure look like it's a really good starting point at safety. But and then Booth and Scene, what's up there? Yeah, great question. <laughs> great question. Well, uh, Andrew Booth Jr., uh, showed some flashes and then got hurt in his first year, which has been an issue for him his whole career. And then this year, I think he was just not a fit. What Brian Flores wants is super aggressive at the line of scrimmage corners or guys who can just run up and make a tackle. We saw them play a lot back and play, you know, zero blitzes and stuff. And, but you gotta be able to come up and make a tackle. And Booth is just not a physical player. If he was playing in Ed Donatel's system where the cornerbacks are playing off coverage a lot and it's really just reading route combinations and making a play on the ball, I think he could fit. I'm not ready to write him off yet as being a bust. Lewisine, I am 100% ready to write him off as being that because this is, not, this is not a guy who's just struggled. This is a guy who they've refused to put on the football field. I mean, we're talking about last year. Theo Jackson, who is a former sixth rounder of the Tennessee <laughs> Titans that came over in the middle of last season, who played more snaps by a mile than Lewis seen his only snaps came in a game where they were getting blown out by green Bay at the very end of the year. There is no belief in him at all. There's no trust in him at all. Uh, they can say whatever they want about his injury, but he played every snap of training camp that he could every OTAs. Uh, and he wasn't starting when he, in his rookie year. Anyway, I think that this is a player who just was not prepared for the NFL and can't handle the NFL. Uh, that his physical ability is astounding. Six foot three, four, three, eight, 40. When you look at him, I was talking about Asamoa thinking he was a running back. Oh, I didn't think Lewis seen was a running back. I was like, who is this Fred Warner looking guy? I mean, he is, he's lanky and he's huge and he was great at Georgia and he just can't play in the NFL. And if I could explain this to you, they would pay yeah. me millions, but I can't, I don't know why I mean, it's, it's, it's commitment. It's understanding of the defense. It's the game is way faster, read and react. And I think what happened to Georgia was things were very simple. It was play back, run up and make a tackle, make a play on the football when they throw deep. And that's all that he was asked to do. Well, in the NFL, if you're a safety for Brian Flores, you better be able to do a lot. And I just don't think he can handle it. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where um... – I think, look, at Alabama, and now we're seeing it at Georgia. We've seen it at Clemson. They get all these star high school players, but the majority of them do not work out in the NFL. And like you said, there's, there's always, they're so good at that level that they don't have to do much. They're just athletically better. But it's a different, it's a different, different deal in the NFL. And uh, a lot of these kids just uh, that's why it's I always, you know, even sometimes the blue chip guys don't seem to work out. There's it's just to me, the, more you see more failures than success stories with those five star kids at those major programs. 
Drafting is hard too. I mean, you know, they were looking for that impact player and they would have not thought twice about Cam Bynum or Josh Metellus. And then you draft those two guys at the fourth and the sixth and they're really good <laughs> yeah. players. You draft a guy in the first. Like this is this is how random and weird. And it just yes. tells you how different of a football game it is in the NFL, yep. where it is so much an intelligence game. I, I just can't stress enough. Bynum and Metellus are two of the most intelligent players you will ever run across. And that's what has helped them succeed in the NFL. And I just don't think that um, Lewis Seen can handle it. And there have been times to not to just completely dump on them, but it's a fascinating thing when you draft somebody in the first round and they don't even play, but where he'd be in a preseason game and make a mistake. And we ask after the game, what happened? It's, ah, you know, I don't know, nothing I could have done or whatever. And you're like, uh, okay, so yeah, I don't think there's a burning desire there either. I, it's, it's, it's hard. Cause again, I'm sure it's not any fun to be the first round bust. Everybody talks about. So I am empathetic to that, but it's probably a myriad of reasons why he hasn't worked out. You know, the coaches or the GMs, it only takes one of them to go, you know, I can, I can, I can get that guy to do what we're, we're asking him to do. I, I can do it. I can coach him up. And mm -hmm. more than, more often than not, you can't. And then throw in the scheme changes and it, it, it's, it's, yeah. But seeing seems like a guy that's just never going to get it, but uh, who knows? Okay. Um, let's wrap up with uh, Joseph because Joseph is uh, a free agent as well. Um, the place kicker. Um, are, are they right now looking for both a place kicker and a punter, uh, or are they just going to look to replace Joseph or resign him? Yeah, I think, uh, at punter, Ryan Wright was a, a huge disappointment for them this year. There was a couple of games that turned on bad punts and I doubt that they forget that they may just look for competition, but they almost, the almost certainly will have somebody else in training camp battling with him or maybe just straight up cut him for a better punter. It was, it was a very poor year. Um, as far as Joseph goes, he's fine. I would say the definition of totally fine. And it'll probably be another situation where they bring in an undrafted free agent to training camp, see if the guy can kick. And, you know, may, maybe they make a change, but he's not Adam Venateri. He's not the second coming or modern, you know, Morton Anderson or something. It's fine. It's, uh, he, can, he can make a 60 yard field goal if you need it. He probably is not going to always be the sharpest where he will surprise you with missing an extra point or something. But when you look around at the league's worst kickers, you could do way worse than Greg Joseph. Yes. Yes. It's, it's always funny with that position because there are some teams, some fan bases that just dread every year. They can't get a guy and he's always, they, oh, it's always letting us down and we can't get a clutch kick. And then, and you get some teams that, you know, they're lucky, very few, you know, like Butker and Tucker and so forth. Um, but, uh, and then you get the Josephs of the world, which really uh, that's, that's your average kicker in the NFL where, Hey, it's not that bad. It's not great, but it's, it could be a lot worse. And that's why a lot of these guys wind up actually kicking for a long time, especially, I mean, you see guys that can kick almost into their forties. That's how hard it is to find reliable kickers in the NFL. hundred percent. And so if you have a, if you have an average one, you should probably stick with them. Yeah. I mean, just because if you go chasing, then you might end up with bad. And if you're bad, it really kills you. Absolutely. All right. So that's it for our first interview, Matthew. Uh, great job. That was awesome. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again, not only for the book, which we're going to get into uh, when we talk to Neil Hornsby as well, the founder of, we've got two founders, the founder of uh, profootballfocus.com and uh, purpleinsider.com. So again, we're going to have uh, links in the description here on this channel. So you can check out how to purchase the book. Uh, you can also find out how to get uh, to uh, the purpleinsider.com website uh, and the Purple Insider podcast. So uh, right now, what are you going to be doing and talking about between now and the draft? Oh, I have it easy. Quarterback. It's all <laughs> quarterback. All those needs we just mentioned, they mean nothing until yeah. we figure out the quarterback situation. So yeah. I'm good. I don't have, I don't have a hard job for a while. Yeah. And I'm sure the fans are really, uh, by the way, the fans, do they have like, uh, somebody that they like, have you, is it too soon? Have they picked their quarterback yet? I think that they are very much split. Everybody's picking their guy that they like, but I think what any of them will be happy with is just 
a guy like yeah, picking someone something new. different, going some new direction, any, anything. And it's that I, I don't mean it to be insulting to Kirk because sure. he's a really, really excellent quarterback, but you need a new direction. So whatever new direction they pick, I think the fans will be excited about. And you know, Kirk, uh, he could have a few more years left and, uh, Maybe he finds the right team. Maybe I mean Pittsburgh, Steelers, Atlanta, team. Raiders. Yeah, there's there's teams out there that need quarterbacks yeah. where he could go. I think Atlanta's probably the best fit. That's interesting. All right. Well, again, Matthew, I really appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you again uh real soon. And uh great job. All right. Thanks so much for having me. You got it.